Hello everybody, how are you today? I hope you're well. Oh. So, um, here we are at the beginning of March and it really crept up on me. It's like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> Aren't I supposed to be doing something about gardening? Oh, just a second, my mattress has gone wonky. I've got a, such a lovely deep mattress on my bench now. <laughs> I cannot wait for my first shed nap of the year. It'll probably be, oh, I don't know, it'll probably be one of those days later in April or the beginning of May. We'll have a sudden little heat wave out of nowhere. I'll come to the garden, I'll do a load of work, and then I'm coming in here and I'm going to lie on my mattress amongst all my cushions and pillows and my blankies. Oh, I can't wait. Which reminds me. <clears throat> Ah, do you remember um, when I was, it was a Sunday on the sofa and I was talking about books and I said I'd read that volume of the P.D. James short stories and I'm not normally a short story reader, uh, but I really, really enjoyed it. So what would be better for the shed than a little volume of short stories, especially if it's something like those crime stories or tales of the unexpected. Oh, I can't wait. I can't. Anyway, that's a ways off yet. But what I thought I'd do today with you guys, I've got a few bits and pieces in mind of things I want to do outside in the garden later. That'll probably be a separate video. Because first of all, I want to talk about how I got everything around me. Yes, my final, I think I finalised my sewing plans. Mm. I think, mostly, maybe not. <laughs> oh, it's the same every year, isn't it? We come up with our plan in January, modify it in February, modify it again in March. By April, we think, oh, I've forgotten to sew such and such. So, here we are at the beginning of the month. I'm switching my brain back on to being a gardener. What do I need to be thinking about, both indoors, outdoors? So, first of all, outdoors. I won't be doing, hmm, I won't be doing any sewing outdoors, no, I don't think so, hmm, the only thing I may do is my spuds in March, but otherwise I'm not going to sew outdoors because it's still a bit, it's, it's still a bit chilly, now obviously, excuse me, I'm having a little itch, obviously every site is different and I may live just two miles down the road from another site where they are starting to do things, so things direct. We all have a little microclimate. You just have to get used to it. And, you know, you learn each year as, as the years go by. Oh, that was a little bit too early. That was a little bit too late. And it's never set in concrete anyway, because we don't know what the weather's going to be doing. You know, this time, two, three years ago or so, we had the beast from the east, so we had a dumping of snow, which stuck around for a week. Yes, so um, I won't be doing any direct sowing. Also, without having a polytunnel or a greenhouse, anything like that, there's not much point in all the things I would want to start. It's still going to be a bit too chilly for them out there. Obviously, I've got those few bits and bobs in the cold frame. It's April, really, when that cold frame is going to start being mega busy. Oh, I can't wait, can't wait. I can't wait for that problem of where am I going to put stuff? It'll be the same at home. So, the seeds I'm going to quickly go through with you today are all my indoor sowings. Now, uh, I thought when I did my seed sort back in January, I put my indoor sowings in the kitchen, my packets in the kitchen. I put my outdoor sewings to come back to the shed and I think they're all here. But I think a couple of them got mixed up because when I was going through these at home the other day, there were a couple missing. So I've got it all here in the shed for now. There were a couple in the shed tin. It'll all come home. Right, so indoor sewings. Um, that's my peppers. The peppers went in around about it's about valentine's day mm, how nice and my orange bell have germinated 
after just two weeks. That's great. My Du Long de Londe and my Feher Ozen, not germinated yet, but peppers can take up to three weeks to germinate. So not too worried, holding out hope. The big thing, oh, I've got so many. The big thing for me will be, and this is going to be in about two weeks time, it's all my precious tomatoes. So, my absolute mainstay, oh that's another pepper, the mainstay of my growing is Gardener's Delight. Look, it's a bog standard boring tomato. I love heritage varieties, I think you all know that by now. I think one of the things I love about heritage varieties is the stories that go with them and we can't help but think of that place and that time when we're sowing them. So a lot of my seeds are French, they make me think of parts of France when I'm sowing them. So I do love all those but I also want things I can rely on. Gardener's Delight is that. It's a cherry tomato, but it can come up quite big. It works perfectly, oh my tummy's grumbling, sorry. Works perfectly well in salads, per works perfectly well cooked as sauces. It's a slightly higher acid tomato than others, so that makes it great for bottling. But if you are trying to follow a reduced acid diet, I would say don't do Gardener's Delight. What I'm excited about this year is, oh, I didn't write the name on the packet. Ugh, sorry, I was given some Gardener's Ecstasy. So if I love Delight, how much am I gonna love Ecstasy? Hopefully a lot. Um, then I've got a mixture of all sorts of other things. I've got some Amish paste, that's from Paul, of Richard and Paul, thank you so much. So they're going to be a bigger, chunkier sort of cooking tomato, I think. Um, I've got, I've just called them Gary's Gorgiosities. <laughs> if you remember last year, one of my plot neighbours, Gary, who you've seen a few times in my videos, he had about, gosh, 40 or 50 tomato plants in. He was then away from the plot for a couple of weeks. Um, oh goodness me, my tummy is rumbling. He'd had some minor surgery, he had to stay away. During that time his tomatoes were decimated by blight. All but two plants. So in these two long rows of black, blackened plants, these two plants were still growing beautifully and producing beautifully. So he gave me a couple of the tomatoes, one of them I ate. <laughs> it was lovely. And the other one I've got a saved seed from. Um, I have the last, oh I'm looking through the packet, looks like I've got three seeds in there. This is the Rose de Bain. This is the one that I lovingly brought all the way back from the south of France. It came on a 14 hour train journey all the way from the south of France to London. Now I've only got three and again I've, I've forgotten to write names on oh this is from Clarice are we Clarice hi Clarice she sent me some more Rose de Bern so if my three fail I've got these as a backup and from my original seed I gave some to a friend and she got a whopper an absolute whopper of, I mean all the all of them did beautifully for her this whopper they called Sebastian and then last year son of Sebastian grew beautifully too and she'd set she'd shared seeds on the seashore that's really hard she'd say she'd shared seeds with another of her friends who they're over in Canada and the the friend put her Rose de Bern tomatoes into a show one of these big you know fancy gardening shows and I think it placed second so you know this, this one random crazy tomato bought in the beautiful vegetable market in Nice, in Provence, that made its way all the way up to London, and then hopped over the pond to Canada, came second in a show. <laughs> I love that. That's what I love about heritage seeds. That's what I mean is 
these seeds have stories how glorious okay get a wriggle on Vivi orange cherry I don't know the name it self seeded last year from seeds the previous year I thought all of those ones the previous year were F1s and they wouldn't come to anything so I didn't save seed this self seeded and did magnificently well my goodness I was cropping and cropping and cropping so I thought, well, it, look, it re if it's a self-seeder and it's doing so well, it really wants to grow and it likes my garden. So let's see if I can cultivate some as well as have random volunteers. And then I got a couple of um, um, spares from someone. I've got a Chadwick cherry, which I've grown before. They're lovely. They're quite small, so if you're a if you're bottling or canning, uh, they're a bit of a fiddle, but they're beautiful to have fresh for salads. Oh my God, I'm thinking of my first Greek salad now. <laughs> Bring it on. And then also some called Get Stuffed. But look at the colour of the flesh on the outside. Isn't that fab? <clears throat> so what I haven't done yet, I haven't worked out exactly how many of each I want to sow. I'll always sow the most of Gardener's Delight, because as I say, that's my... That's my absolute, um, the one I rely on. Okay, so that's tomatoes. That'll be mid-March. Towards the end of March, still indoors, my cucumbers. God, this is my long, long green maracha. Again, it's a, it's a, it's another heritage French cucumber. Grows perfectly well outside. No bitterness. The skin can be a little bit tough. If you're accustomed to your nice greenhouse supermarket cucumbers, you may find the skin of long green marriage a bit tough. I actually like it for that because it gives the dish a bit of bite. Um, you know, so often there's a lot of vegetarian food that's quite soft. So I quite like something that's bitey and crunchy. They're quite fat, so you get a lot of flesh with them. So if you find, you try them and you don't like the flesh, just take the, the sorry, the skin, just whip the skin off, and there's still plenty of flesh to enjoy. So that's my cucumbers. Also indoors, I'm hopping families now. Oh, not quite, is, oh, I haven't got my own saved ones. I finally harvested one loofah. <laughs> it's like that long. It's a pathetic little thing, but I've saved some seeds from it. But I've also got some loofah seed. I am going to try it again. I know I said I wasn't going to bother, but I've got a separate plan for it this year, and it's not going to take up space in the vegetable cathedral. So yes, start those indoors. They need quite a long season, uh, which is A, why I've got a separate plan for them, and B, you know what, I think actually I might even sow these today. Where are we beginning? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sow these today. Um, right, like I say, hopping families. Celery. This is it's the celery I grow every year. It's Utah. Well, I thought it was called Green Utah. I've been sent these two different packs. This is this lovely botanical interests packet that's intriguingly invites you to open the packet in order to read what's on the inside of the packet. But as you saw in the tour video, oh, this would be great if I can. I'm hoping that I can leave a couple of my own celery, celery plants in to produce some seed for me for next year. That would be great. I've never, I've never had my own celery seed. Then finally, almost finally, Esther, I'm gonna do flowers in a second I have <laughs> more types of squash than you can shake a stick at so I have been I've been gifted so many squash oh sorry sorry halt the squash idea back to the loofah a chopcha this is some like um bought seed I mean I didn't did I buy this? I, I think I did buy this a couple of years ago. But of course, somewhere, I think I've got a drawer in my bureau with more seeds in. 
I'll have a look. But I've got my own save seed now. So I had really, really good fruits last year. And I finally plucked up the courage right towards the end of the season to actually try and eat it. Really, really enjoyed them. The taste I finally decided was somewhere between cucumber and a pepper. So when they're really young and quite tender, you can chop them up raw and eat them as you would a cucumber in a salad. When they're a bit bigger, I chopped them and cooked them and that's when they, they taste a little bit of pepper. So they and the loofah, yes. Right, and then on, in, in other news, it's all these various different types of squash. I mean, there's so many of them. Uh, I am going to try the Waltham butternuts again. They're the ones that didn't do very well for me last year, but it seems across the board, most people struggled with their Walthams last year, which could relate back to the previous year, 2018, when we, we were in drought for 11 weeks. So I was speculating last year that they were struggling because they'd come from parent plants, which haven't done very well in that heat and drought. I don't know going to try them again otherwise um, so I've got new seed stock uh, from oh this is from the the seed cooperative I will be doing some of my old favorites like I think I've got a, a couple left of the sucrine du berry the thing with pumpkins and squash seed is I, I don't save my own because they're all in such close proximity and it's a it's quite a small site and everyone's growing different squash. They would cross pollinate like bilio and I'd have no idea what I'm going to get. I might have a happy accident, I might get some great squash, but on the other hand I can't afford to give over a whole bed to, uh, to all these possible squashes, get to the end of the season and find that Firstly, the squash tastes dreadful or they haven't grown well, what have you. So I do tend to start with fresh seed each year. I say fresh, sometimes it's leftover seed from last year. So yes, the, the Delicata, the Sucrine, the Carnival, the Cream of the Crop and um, random other... You know, I mean, I've just got so many. I'm going to have to... Oh, and the, um, I think this came from Clarisse as well. Yes, it's a French packet. The Mousquet de Provence. How oh, great. Maybe I should put that alongside my Rose de Bain. So I've got my two little Provencal plants growing next to each other. They can keep each other company. There, there, like I said, there's tons and tons of squash and um, I need to rationalise and finally decide which ones I'm growing. And when I do, I'll tell you properly then and, and at the same time, I'll, I'll try and give a little, um, what do you call it, a little taggy thing under the, on the, I'll try and write the name on the screen. <laughs> I'm giddy. I want to get going. Right, so then there's two flowers I'm going to start indoors. It seems a bit odd, doesn't it? I don't think of starting flowers, or at least I don't. Now look, the... This is a vegetable garden. It's a kitchen garden. Primarily, this garden is about feeding me. But I love flowers as much as the next person, so I do try and fit flowers in here and there for my own pleasure, of course. And as you all know by now, <coughs> excuse me, with the calendula, I use them to make my balms. Although the balm's not working very well at the moment on my poor skin. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, a bowl of petals, they're edible, yes, but they're not a meal. <laughs> so they're never a priority in terms of food. However, they're so important in terms of our beautiful pollinators. And I'm going to share something about bees with you in a minute. Can't wait. So, yes, it makes absolute sense in an organic garden where we're trying to you know maximize our biodiversity we're trying to look after the planet as a whole but also our own little space 
it absolutely makes sense that we look after the pollinators and we have things in the garden which aren't necessarily for us to eat but are for them to eat so pardon me as i was showing in the tour video all my brassicas that have blown they are going to stay exactly where they are until i until the very last minute when i need those beds the rosemary that's great at this time of year what i haven't checked oh yes i can just see some over there we're getting into that time of year where our fruit trees will start to blossom and the bees will love it it always seems that the nut trees come into blossom before the fruit trees i don't know if that's true uh certainly around here it seems to be true because my neighbor's sheen is almond tree i'll show you that at some point yes so let us think about the pollinators now i've got a whole load of flower seed to sow but i'll probably be sowing that into april either in cells in the cold frame or as you've seen in the past i literally just scratch them into the dirt and let it do its own thing so at the end of last autumn my cosmos came so late uh that by the time it was going to flower i was thinking, yeah i might get some seed i might get some seed we then had such grotty weather that the, the flower heads rotted before they had a chance to um divert their seed so at the end of the season i just tipped a not a packet, you know, tipped a few and simply scratched them into the the soil at the top of that bed. So yes, most of them I'll be doing in April outside, either out outside or in the cold frame. But I'm going to do two at home because they need longer <laughs> and um, I've tried, okay, let me tell you, so I'm going to do my sideritis which is the mountain tea. Oh, I forgot to show you in the tour video. That mountain tea plant that Paul gave me is looking really a bit poorly. I don't know if it's got too cold or what, but it's looking quite sad and saggy. So I am going to try mountain tea again this year. It's possible that I gave up on them too soon last year because apparently, just reading this, it can take up to three months for germination so I thought if I have it at home it's not that it's going to be out of sight out of mind but it's more that I'm going to treat it as a house plant almost so that when things get really busy imagine in three months time the cold frame is going to be mental busy with things hardening off what have you what have you I don't want to in a fit of impatience think right they're not working chuck it because the pot's in the way so I'll just keep it at home. And the other thing, have I got a seed in there somewhere? Actually, it doesn't look like there's any seed in there. Oh, I'll check later. A couple maybe. And then the other thing, for goodness sakes, I'm going to start some echinacea again. I've tried twice. Once, nothing. Once, um... I got wee little things came up about, you know, they had maybe two or three or four two leaves. They were like that for six months, didn't do anything, then they keeled over. No idea why. So it says to start them off in a greenhouse at 16 to 18 degrees between February and April. So what I'm thinking is my bathroom is plenty bright enough but it, I don't heat it I don't heat the bathroom so I reckon that's about the right temperature and again if it's going to take if it's going to be a fuss pot and take forever months to do anything you can just sit on the bathroom window so it won't be in the way right whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> busy time so sorry this has been where's my water this has been quite a ta -ta -ta, um video hasn't it but oh, it's just great to crack into the seeds isn't it so on the word of pollinators my mum belongs to a garden club and they have guest speakers coming in once a month and I was chatting to her at the weekend and she was telling me about the last guest speaker they'd had and it was he was talking about bees and she started telling me I think she got a transcript of his notes or something. 
so I said, oh, I've got to jot this down, I've got to share it, because I just loved it. She started off by saying to me, did you know that bees have smelly feet? It's like, what? Mother, <laughs> take your medicine. Um, so I'm just going to read this. So this is from, oh, I shouldn't say the speaker's name. Anyway, I found all of this really interesting, fascinating, so I thought I'd share it with you. So, he said that the first records of bees go right back to the time of the dinosaurs. I had no idea. There are over 255 species of bumblebees. No wonder I struggle with identification. Cuckoo bumblebees, like their bird namesakes, um, they use the nest of two bumblebees to raise their own offspring. It's mad, doesn't it? Uh, right, here we go. This is the smelly feet bit. Did you know that bumblebees have smelly feet? Ooh, cheesy. They have a substance on their body and their feet, which they use to mark the flower once they've stripped it of pollen and nectar. And that smell lets subsequent visiting bumblebees know not to waste their time. Such amazing creatures. They have a short... They have, bumblebees have a very short lifespan. It doesn't say what the lifespan is. I'll have to look that up. Ah, this is what I didn't know. Bumblebees do not die after stinging, unlike honeybees. Their sting has no barb to it. So it doesn't come out with the sting. So that means they can sting you several times in a row and not die. However, they don't want to sting you. So if you see a bumblebee apparently waving its legs, that's the bumblebee's way of saying, leave me alone, I don't want to sting you. So if they start waggling their legs at you, just move away, give them some space. Love it. A bumblebee's wings beat 150 times or more per second. I can't compute that. That's crazy. So of course they have a fast metabolism. The metabolism is so fast that they are always only about 40 minutes away from starving. Wow, even on a full stomach. <clears throat> All the more reason to just chock fill our gardens with stuff for them to eat. Uh, bumblebee nests are small compared to honeybees, as each nest contains only a few hundred individuals. The nests are built in several places, depending on the type of bumblebee. They can be underground, as some of you may have experienced when mowing your lawn for the first time in spring and disturbing a bee nest. Bird boxes, inside stone walls. I've seen them. Actually, I saw some video footage of this where... A colony had in the, uh, what do you call it, in the mortar between two courses of bricks in someone's house. It was the tiniest, tiniest hole in the mortar and they'd gone through that and then inside the brickwork was this massive, massive colony. Amazing. Amazing that they can dig out the mortar. <clears throat> yes, so all sorts of places to nest. Uh... It says, unlike a honeybee, a bumblebee nest is used for only one year and then it's abandoned. They may reappear in the same area from year to year, but they don't reuse an old nest. Between 50 and 400 bumblebees live in a colony, unlike the honeybee that may have 20 to 80,000 living in a hive. Yeah, I found that... I <laughs> Look, the natural world is fascinating, isn't it? It's brilliant. And it's really kind of turned my attention this year to, you know, is there more? There's always more we can be doing to help our wildlife, help our nature. Um, my, I've got my two bee houses that are on the fence. Actually, I want to move them because they've been swamped by the Taunton Dune, so I'm going to move them a bit. And I'm going to wait for any that are in there, that have been in there over winter, to emerge. And then I'm going to give it a clean. So I was thinking, how am I going to clean it? Because it's like little sort of bamboo, oh, 
hollow bamboo sticks. But then I suddenly thought, you know, obviously we're trying not to use disposable plastic these days, so people have converted to bamboo or metal drinking straws. And I thought, oh, I've seen, you can get these little, they're like bottle brushes on a stiff wire, but they're really, really tiny for getting into the straw. So I thought that would be, hopefully, might be, will be perfect for giving my bee houses a clean so that later on in the year, new bees can find them and use them for making their little nests in. So, ah, there we go. It's an exciting time of year, isn't it? All systems, oh my jaw cracked. <laughs> all systems ready to go. Um, like I say, this is all indoor sewing. Um, obviously I'm looking forward to the outdoor sewing, but I'm more than happy that that's going to be at least a month away because it is still quite chilly in terms of just doing slow work in the garden, like seed sewing and making drills. So it's a bit chilly and <clears throat> I've still got some bed prep and what have you to do. So I'm really glad that the garden side of seed sewing isn't for a while. I'm delighted that I can get a ton of stuff going at home. And while all this is happening at home, I can get stuck into all those little outstanding jobs I've been meaning to tackle for ever <laughs> this winter. So that's more than enough for this video. Please enjoy yourselves getting your indoor sewings <clears throat> underway. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I was going to say, don't go too mad. We can't help it, can we? We just cannot help it. But whatever you're planning for your garden this year, please, please, please just have a little thought running along, alongside of everything you do in the garden this year. Have that little thought running alongside, which is all about the wildlife. And in particular, like I said this year, I really want us all to think about our pollinators and what we can do to help them. So, happy pollinator thoughts, everybody. I'll see you all again really soon, I hope. In the meantime, cheerio.